for me, I'm very much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, here's a problem, let's, let's take care of it. I have a solution for that. Our goal when we opened was to provide the highest quality care that was possible at a price people could afford. I literally talk to physicians daily. Kelly, I can't uh, even log in to see my own billing. I have no idea what's going on. I get a report once a month and nobody can explain it to me. I make it a point to train the physicians how to go and pull their own report. I'm going to be on the course reporting tomorrow afternoon. You are. I am. I'm going to follow Jordan Spieth and Will Zalatoris and Scotty Scheffler. I'm not really reporting, but I am going to go watch the part. <laughs> Probably drink a couple beers. Yeah, too. I might have a beer or two uh, tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. I mean, that would make my commentary even better. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, what is now episode 20 of the Cutting Edge podcast. Uh, a unique milestone for us. Uh, we have a really cool topic today for those of us in healthcare. Uh, if you're not in healthcare, probably this is going to bore you to tears. But uh, we are going to be talking about Stark Law changes coming in 2022. But before we jump into that with our uh, our esteemed guest, Kevin Mitchell, and is it Kevin Mitchell Esquire? I don't use that. I don't use that uh, <laughs> suffix. No. Uh, so uh, before we do that, we're going to give we need to give some mentions to the folks that have helped support us and, and get us here. Uh, so Texas Assist, which happens to be my firm, Surgical Assist Staffing Group, Carrington Group, uh, Gordon Highlander, uh, of course, Weaver Johnston Nelson, great um, healthcare specific uh, law firm here in Dallas. Uh, Ortho Lone Star has helped us along the way. And then uh, Jen Eaton at Moonshot Marketing Group. She's been a great help in getting us started and building our social media presence. Um, but a, a great shout out and thanks to, to all those folks that have helped us uh, get going and keep going. It's uh, It's been a labor of love thus far. We haven't had a ton of viewers, but we're picking up steam. So uh, you can find us a bunch of different ways too. You can find us. We have a Facebook page. Um, we have a linkedin page uh twitter uh instagram however we don't tick tock and we don't snapchat that i sadly so my past, uh past that one generation yeah, yeah sadly my uh my co-host is just he's not in for that although i did challenge him on an earlier podcast about coming up with a tick tock dance for halloween with his wife yeah. and his young son so we'll see if that happens i think you should make it happen but uh you can find us. Uh, people always want to know how they can find us and find our podcast. So we um, we post these episodes on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Um, and of course, they'll be posted to all of our social media sites as well. Uh, so certainly follow us. Uh, lots of interesting episodes. And uh, without ado, let's jump right in. So Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. And, Happy to uh, be here. Stark Law Changes. So... It, uh, it causes me to shiver when I hear the words Stark Law together. Yeah, I understand that. It's, uh, it's not the most fun regulation to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, so, so before we jump into that, tell us a little bit about you and sure. and, uh, and your affiliation with Weaver Johnston Nelson. Sure, I uh, my name is Kevin Mitchell, as CJ said. Uh, I am a senior associate at Weaver Johnston Nelson. I think I've six years now been with the firm. Um, I basically am a regulatory healthcare attorney that also does some transactional work. So kind of the full gamut of healthcare work. Um, our firm focuses relatively exclusively on healthcare work, as you know. Um, our clients range from licensed providers individually to facilities as well as healthcare businesses. Um, we can help with HIPAA matters, compliance issues, basic contracts, employment agreements, larger transactions. And then we also have attorneys that focus on real estate, uh, cannabis law now, um, litigation, little, and- A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything, but it's mainly healthcare related businesses and providers, so. Gotcha. So for you, are you a, are you a Texas uh, Texas law guy? Where'd yeah, you, where'd, you, uh, I am, where'd you go to law school? I am licensed only in Texas. I okay. went to law school at the University of Houston Law Center. Okay. Uh, UT undergrad from Fort Worth. So okay. kind of been all over the state of Texas, Fort only state Worth, of Texas. But you defected and went to UT. Uh, didn't defect, I would say. That's a, it's a <laughs> family family school for the most part. Uh, although my little brother did go to TCU. Okay. Which is 
It's just a little too close to home for me with my parents still living yeah. in Fort Worth. So there you go. So friendly rivalry in the fall. Oh, it's been mainly in his favor uh, overall, but yeah, it's been a fun ten years or so to have both schools in the Big Twelve. Although, as you know, that will be changing here soon. Yeah. So. Yeah, that'll be an interesting change yes. for sure. So. For our audience that doesn't um, that doesn't live day in and day out in healthcare, when we talk about uh, the Stark Law, maybe share just a, a close notes version of what is the Stark Law and sure. why was it put in place? Sure, it's a federal regulation that I believe was originally passed in 1989 and focused exclusively on self referrals of laboratory services, and then over time it's expanded and expanded, and now the the general prohibition that most most people in the healthcare space are aware of is it, it's a law that generally prohibits physicians from referring um, designated health services payable by Medicare to an agency which they have a financial relationship with, unless there's an exception that applies. And that's a basic prohibition, but the Stark Law is complicated in that basically each of those words I just said has a definition. The exceptions are complicated. And so that's really why I would generally advise that if you're dealing with a Stark Law issue, you you know, seek specific legal advice and don't necessarily just take what I'm saying here today for education purposes as what, uh, as the end all be all. But, um, at the end of the day, the, the main focuses are, is there a referral for designated health services, which designated health services are ancillary services, such as lab services, PT, um, imaging, some of those types of ancillary services physician practices may offer as well as home health and some other, uh, other service types. Um, is a referral for designated health services to an entity the physician has a financial relationship, which can be ownership, investment, or compensation. So in a physician practice setting, an employment agreement between a physician and the practice is a compensation okay, so, financial so relationship. So I, I have a question relative to that. So I, we hear anti-kickback statutes or anti-kickback laws. Is that the same thing or, or is that something different than Stark Law. The Stark Law and the federal anti-kickback statute are distinct federal statutes. They're both fraud and abuse statutes, and there's some similarities. Okay. Um, the Stark Law is different in that it's strict liability, meaning you don't have to have intent to violate it. So if you don't meet an exception, you make a prohibited referral for DHS, um, you violated the statute. The anti-kickback statute is different in that it's broader. It doesn't apply just to physicians. It can be anybody in the healthcare space that's, or it applies more broadly to healthcare too but it is an intent-based statute. So they have safe harbors, which are similar to exceptions. You don't necessarily have to meet one um, like you do for Stark. Um, but if you have even one purpose is of your arrangement is to generate referrals, um, that that's, could be considered a violation of the anti-kickback statute. So they're similar, but different. And a lot of, a lot of hair on these rules, huh? Yes, there is. Uh, Stark, again, strict liability. You need an exception to apply if the law is implicated. And I kick back, you don't necessarily need to. It's more, there's potentially arrangements that are more in a gray area, potentially. Um, and the OIG, which is the Office of the Inspector General, which enforces the anti back statute, uh, publishes guidance on some arrangements that may or may not violate the anti kickback back statute. So you, we sometimes look at those for guidance, but yeah, it's unfortunately not always the cleanest or clearest of what what arrangement does fit into with those safe harbors or exceptions. Gotcha. So so does Stark Law uh, do Stark Law I guess guidelines, do they only apply to individual physicians? Do they apply to physician groups? So they yeah, uh, they, they apply to physicians and I should clarify also or physicians and so the financial relationship can be a physician or an immediate family member too. So they basically you, you can't just put ownership interest in your spouse's name, for instance, and then still refer to that entity. That's still considered a self-referral. But in the context of physician practices, um, the Stark Law would apply to the physician practice as well. So Okay. Well, and I think that's kind of where we're headed with our conversation today. Because part of what part of the reason we're having this conversation is that there was a an orthopedic practice administrators meeting that happened here in the DFW area uh, a few weeks back. And Josh Weaver, um, one of your our colleagues- area, and, Managing member at our firm. And, and yep. one of the managing members gave a very, very brief uh, kind of express overview of the group practice changes coming mm -hmm. um, in 2022. And there were more questions about his little brief presentation than any other presentation that day. So. If you could um, maybe start to unpack 
some of yep. those group practice changes that are coming January 1st, I think that'd be a great place to start. Sure, sure. So those, what you're referring to that come into effect January 1, 2022, were a part of a, a CMS final rule that came out the end of 2020, and the majority of that rule went into effect on January 19th of 2021. However, the group practice changes that you're referring to, they delay the effectiveness until January 1, 2022. So the general overall purpose of this final rule was to clarify and modernize parts of the Stark laws, I think the definition of what the final rule was. And specifically with respect to group practice changes, they delayed the effectiveness of those specifically to give physician groups time to potentially change their compensation plans. And the primary changes related to what's characterized as overall profits. So in the group practice context, and it's group practice is a defined term, as is every Stark Law <laughs> word, um, at 42 CFR 411.352 outlines certain requirements to be considered a group practice. And most physician practices would want to be able to meet those requirements so that then other exceptions to the Stark Law are more easily met. But specifically in this context, the overall profits concept allows group practices to distribute shares of overall profits related to designated health service revenues. So imaging revenue, lab revenue, et cetera. And the changes, the primary changes, although if you look at it, doesn't seem like they're significant because there's slight wording changes. One of the primary changes was CMS clarified that the group must aggregate revenue for all designated health services. So that basically means that you can't just pay off just laboratory DHS. You got to aggregate laboratory and uh, imaging together, together before you decide how you're going to distribute that to the group. And then either you have to distribute to all of the group, or you can divide your group practice into components of five and potentially distribute differently there. But the primary difference is you got, you can't do split pooling or service by service to where you just choose one designated health service line and just distribute that you got to aggregate all together. That's interesting. And that's so essentially if you have a physician group that is in these arrangements with imaging and laboratory services and physical therapy and surgical assist services, and let's just say there's five or six of those arrangements. Yeah, they have to pull all of them together now. All of the profits of all the, the profits lines, of yes. all those service lines from all of the members of the practice. It's it's so it, it, you can do it. It's either all of the practice or you can divide your your group into components of five. Is the is okay the when you say components of five? You so mean, if you have ten physicians, you could have two separate components of of five physicians. Got it. And in each okay. of those components, you could potentially pay the overall profits differently. So if in one, you could pay. Say we aggregate a hundred thousand in profits, we could do a per capita basis in one, and then okay. the other one we could potentially pay at the same percentage as we pay other non DHS revenues. There's different ways you could determine the profit or the profit distribution, but you you have to do it if you if you break it up into two components, all the one component group of five and all the other component group of five have to be treated the same in those components, or you Got can it. keep everybody together. It's again, so you it's, basically, you basically, you have, it's, you have to, whoever's in that group, you have to treat them all the same, Correct. but you can tr tr treat people in two different groups yep. differently. If you have that number of physicians, if you have that instance, number yep. of physicians, yep. but you have to have five physicians in a group. Well, if you have less than five, you just have to treat all three. But you have, three you just, okay. Yeah. Got so it. it's so, somewhat confusing, but they added that component group of five clarification in these changes. Interesting. So what do you what do you think the net effect of, of that is going to be? I mean, have you had clients come to you for counsel on this to say, how do we need to change this? Do you have you had clients come to you and say, well, we're just not going to mess with that anymore? I mean, what what's been what's started to occur with your firm? What what have you heard from your clients? I mean, is there is this alarming? Is this good? I, I don't think it's alarming per se. I think we've had lots of questions about how to evaluate current compensation methodologies and whether or not they comply with Stark or if they've complied with Stark all along, um, those types of questions. And it's come up more so in, we've done a few restructuring of some physician groups and it's come up with setting compensation methodologies going forward. Um, but overall, I, I, we haven't had clients that are too alarmed with these changes. I, I don't know, generally speaking, if 
if the industry has had, I have not seen crazy commentary that people are way against this or anything, but I think that the concept of not being able to split pool explicitly is the potential major change there. Um, and then there was just lots of clarification on generally what kind of, you know, does a group have to distribute profits? Can we withhold some money? Those types of things that CMS opined on as well, um, which we've so So providing. maybe, so so share a little bit on that, right? Because most, my I guess my thought, you just said something that was interesting to me, which is dollar in, dollar out. My assumption's always been that a physician group makes a dollar that they're going to want to push the dollar out to the members of the group, right? They want to distribute the money out. But what is this particular Oh, you so I mean change. essentially it's not necessarily a, a change here it's more clarification but essentially CMS just said you don't have to necessarily distribute over profits if you don't want to I mean the group could choose to retain okay. retain money um, those types of things um, and then there's clarification on just how you potentially can determine different components of a group um, whether it be by specialty or location or something like that um, and, it, and then it, and then there was just some more additional clarification on a different concept other than overall profits, which is personal productivity bonuses, which was there's two different compensation um, methodologies in the group practice uh, definition, um, which the personal productivity bonuses is being paid on personally performed services or those incident to your personally performed services. And that didn't really change, but there's just additional commentary on that as well. So. How often changes like this happen? I mean, this 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 seems like this was really really detailed. Well, yeah, and this was just part of it. I mean, it's a few hundred page rule. Um, overall, this 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 time this was a major overhaul for Stark Law changes. I mean, there's commentary. Let's say on an annual or semi annual basis with respect to addressing people's comments on what they would like to see changed uh, with the Stark Law, and occasionally there's new exceptions added that we can talk about some of what those look like as well um, that are added over time. Um, but this was a more major overhaul where they not only revised this group practice definition, they went through and revised some of the basic definition, definitions, basic concepts of the exceptions, added some new exceptions around value base, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, yeah. So, so this was, this was a, this was a, bigger overhaul. And at the same time, the NK back statute was also changed as well. So there was a joint effort there to issue two rules at the same time. Interesting. So, so maybe go into some of those exceptions, exceptions sure. that you just mentioned sure. that, that were changed or they were added. Yeah. So just generally, again, Stark law, strict liability. So you need an exception to apply. And if you want to refer to an entity that you have a financial relationship with, and there's ownership, investment, compensation, and there's different exceptions for each of those financial relationship types. Um, ownership compensation, the one that group practices most often will strive to meet is the in-office ancillary services exception, which essentially focus on who's providing the service, where it's provided, and who bills. And if you meet all those requirements of those three categories, you can provide in-office ancillary services, like imaging. That's one that applies to compensation and ownership. Ownership specific, I mean, there's an exception for publicly traded securities, mutual funds, and then ownership in certain provider types like hospitals, which, as you may be aware, the ACA banned physician and hospitals going forward or changed the whole hospital exception more technically. So where after 2011, you have to be grandfathered in or you can't have a physician on Medicare participating hospitals. So that was a stark law change. And then the ones that where physicians are probably more aware of are compensation based. So there's one for leases of space and equipment. There's one for employment, physician recruitment. So a hospital wants to enter to a re recruitment or relocation agreement with a physician. That's an exception. Um, there are some changes to those. There's changes to the fair market value exception. And the main, the main additions were though, were the value-based uh, exceptions that were added in an attempt to try to allow more innovative arrangements in the healthcare space to not violate the Stark law. Gotcha. Well, let, let's talk about the value-based uh, care arrangements and, and the Stark Law implications, right? Because that's value-based care arrangements seem to be um, up and coming, especially with physicians groups. Yes. The payers really are pushing the boundary and Medicare and CMS seem to be pushing the boundary with trying to engage certain yeah. specialties in these arrangements. So. Talk to us a little bit about that. Okay, yeah. So CMS has some of its own value-based type arrangements and programs that it 
implements on its own, but these these exceptions were uh, CMS's attempt to, I guess, allow the healthcare space to come up with its own value-based arrangements and move forward on those. And there's three exceptions that to the Stark Law that were implemented. Um, one one exception was full risk value-based arrangements. One was meaningful downside risk, and one is more catch-all, no risk. Um, exception okay and so that, let's some pat let's some yeah, there's, there's 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 three and three they all so, have they, they kind of from full risk to no risk there's more requirements you have to meet on each one to meet the exception based based on um the level of risk the physicians are undertaking but just let me back up real fast cms defines a value-based arrangement as any any arrangement for the provision of at least one value-based activity for a target population patient population and then each of those again stark law has its own definition, but really at the end of the day, it's the you know coordinating care, improving quality, lowering cost. Those triple aim is a common term. In this case, there's quadruple aim. There's one other one that transitioning from a healthcare delivery payment mechanisms based on volume to quality as well. So those that's the main focus of a value based arrangement for Stark purposes. And then from there, you need to meet the exception, and let's we can start with full financial risk. I mean, basically the main component of that is it's an arrangement where the physicians are taking on full financial risk of the patient care, the full full scope of patient care within 12 months of the start of the arrangement is the primary primary uh, uh, requirement. So those are probably more arrangements with payers directly. Okay, so in, that, so, in that situa- so in that situation, are we talking about like Medicare managed care programs where the physician's getting paid uh, there's a Stark Law exception. The physician enters into an agreement, and they're getting paid a per member per month fee, and they're at full exposure for any loss they might incur. That's above that that amount that they're receiving for the patient's care. Is that what they would consider full risk? Or explain like I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding. So like, I think it would be an arrangement with a payer. So instead of being compensated from a payer fee for service, they are they're compensated based on quality. And you know I haven't I haven't done one of these arrangements yet, but they're essentially at the end of the day exposed for the full cost of all the care they're providing. So if if the contract says they're going to pay X and it ends up costing, you know, significantly more to care for that patient population, they're on the hook for, for that extra cost. Um, but conversely, if they can provide that care for less, correct, they get to keep the Delta. Yeah, correct. And yeah, that's my understanding. And Stark law now doesn't prevent that profit from staying in the doctor's pocket. Yeah, correct. Correct. Okay. And then the meaningful financial risk is slightly different in that, it is the physician is potentially on the hook to either repay or forego 10% of the total value of the remuneration of the arrangement. So if you come up with it's worth $100,000, they either potentially have to, there's a penalty that they have to pay back or they have to give up that 10% if they don't meet the quality or whatever metrics they put in place. Okay. And then the one that I think we've seen uh, clients attempting to use is the value-based arrangement, the basic one that has no risk. Um, and it, it could be the example CMS gives in this case is a hospital believes a dual modality, a different type of test for cancer screening is more effective than the one physicians are currently using on its medical staff. So essentially it allows them to pay the physician to change their behaviors, $10 if they refer to this new screening as opposed to the old one over a two year period because they believe it takes that much time to change a physician's behavior. So essentially is allowing a hospital the physician refers to, to pay the physician to change their behavior to a different type of test. Interesting. Um, but the, the downside or one of the requirements of this arrangement is you have to monitor the arrangement. And if it's not achieving the, if you're no longer achieving the value-based activity, um, striving to get to the value-based purpose, then you have to cease that arrangement. So if they figure out that the test they're paying for is no longer effective, they, they need to stop that arrangement essentially. So, okay, I'm going to ask a stupid question, right? Because I don't, I, I don't deal with Stark Law in yeah. my day-to-day profession in what we do in healthcare. But how often do you come across Stark Law um, 
effect and you go, this makes absolutely no sense. This is outdated. This just shouldn't even remotely apply anymore. I, yeah, I mean, I have those thoughts pretty often and I'll say it like I'm saying most of this without looking at my notes, but even yeah. Josh or me, anytime we're, even for basic Stark Law problems, we'll still pull up the regulations to make sure we're tracking because it's, you know, pages and pages of definitions and, you know, referring to this, referring to that. You got to look at the guidance in the Federal Register for issues, whether to see whether CMS has opined on issues. So there are certain what seem like maybe silly situations that, you know, it's an arrangement where there's no intent to violate the law. But again, intent's not needed to violate the Stark Law. So you run into some technical situations where maybe somebody didn't sign a contract. There's a signature requirement on that exception. If you're speaking to administrators who might be listening to this, um, is there a basic sniff test that can be applied to uh, compensation arrangements or um, any type of ancillary arrangement where you could say, this smells fishy or, you know what, this is clean, keep on moving? Or, I mean, I think, or how would you respond to that kind of question? I think the, the, the basic way I would handle that is just go back to what the general prohibition is. Stark Law prohibits a physician from referring DHS payable by Medicare to an entity with which that physician or its immediate family member has a financial relationship. So, I mean, you have to you have to meet all of those elements to have a Stark Law issue. So if, if there's not a referral for DHS, I mean, you got that's that's one component. And what what and what is not DHS is an issue we look at somewhat regularly, and it's not always the easiest way to answer. I mean, there are there is a code list CMS publishes that lists by CPT code what imaging, PT, radiation therapy, and lab services are DHS. So that's one potential useful tool to look at. Interesting. Uh, is that something people can find yeah. on your website, or how it's, how do they get a hold of that? If you just type in CMS designated code list, there's a CMS.gov website that should pop up, and they republish the list annually. Okay. So that's one potential tool. Um, you got to then figure out if there's a financial relationship. If the physician doesn't have a financial relationship with that entity, then I mean, there's not a star call issue. I but, mean, the first the very first thing I think about is how hard is it to be a doctor and make and make money these days? Yeah, like, I mean, it, it's this is this is ridiculous. It's yeah, I mean, for certain arrangements, I I see that. I mean, the overall intent again is to prevent self referrals, to basic fraud and abuse self referral issues, but it's casting a wide net to all arrangements, yeah. and then then over time they've built in these exceptions for situations that are common business arrangements like a lease, for instance, yeah. that don't apply but yeah it's it, it can be cumbersome i mean at the end of the day if you have a question about stark law issue i would advise speaking to an attorney that deals with the stark law regularly whether that's us or somebody else um because it is it is unique in the healthcare space yeah you know i i i just i default back to being in the administrator's shoes because oftentimes physicians don't even consider some of these issues how often would you recommend that a physician's group or practice uh pressure test their stark law compliance um i don't have a specific timeline per se i would say for instance if they're changing comp physician compensation methodology is one example um if there's an employment agreement form or template they plan to use regularly to have that looked at, at the front end and then not change it without talking to an attorney over time. Um, it, and then really, I mean, generally any contract that's not a normal, like that's with another healthcare provider or an entity with which the physicians may refer, such as a hospital, like a coverage agreement for an ED or something like that. Um, okay. It's really, those, those are the main areas. Um, I mean, if it's a contract with a cleaning department or something, that's not going to be a stark issue. Probably. Right. I mean, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's going to be contracts with any entity that your physicians have a financial relationship with or any arrangement, if it's management agreement or something like that, or a hospital or facility, I would recommend talking, at least talking with an attorney or running some traps on whether you think the stark law applies or not. Okay. So let's, let's talk. Um, and if you, again, if you have time or, um, you know, we've got a few minutes left, I, I think people would love to hear about any changes to anti-kickback statutes, um, or, 
uh, any of the other kind of what I would call related rule changes in this area of healthcare. Sure. Um, anything that comes to mind that people should really be aware of. Yeah, I mean, anti-kickback statute, the, I mean, the overall um, law did not change too much. There was changes to the safe harbors. They had similar value-based uh, safe harbors come into play, although they are they use similar terminology to the Stark law, but um, they're pretty different in that the safe harbors don't, of the anti-kickback statute don't protect monetary remuneration, so it's just in kind. So a lot of a lot of arrangements that may meet a stark exception are not going to fully meet a safe harbor. But at the end of the day, that's like we've talked about at the beginning. Um, not meeting fully meeting a safe harbor doesn't necessarily mean you've violated the anti kickback statute. It's a intent based analysis. The OIG would look at the entire arrangement if they scrutinized it. Um, we do generally recommend just as general practice to try to meet as many elements of a safe harbor as possible, if even if you're not going to fully satisfy one. Um, so that's that's one thing that the, they had similar value based um, safe harbors. There were changes to some of the other basic safe harbors as well. Um, I didn't spend a bunch of time preparing those, so I, I'm not no, off okay. the top of my head. I'm not remembering anything well, crazy so, significant uh, that I think we need to talk about right now. But yeah, so I you know I guess last question for me, and and this may be a question for the audience, right? Because it's essentially impossible to be 100% compliant all the time with the complexity of all these rules and regulations. So in your experience, in your firm's experience, if somebody is doing the best they can with what they know and what they have, and they uncover a violation, they come across something that happens, what should they do? I would, I would reach out to an attorney, first off. Um, I mean, they may, depending on what law we're talking about, there may be affirmative reporting obligations to the government that they violated that law. Uh, they're also like for HIPAA, for instance, um, and I don't deal with OCR investigations, there's a notification to patients process, notifications to the government process, and that varies based off the number of patients whose PHI was affected. So I mean, it depends on what the violation is. Um, are there always affirmative reporting requirements? No, not necessarily. But I mean, the, the level of risk with not reporting varies as well. So it's, I would say, reach out to a, a healthcare attorney to discuss discuss those potential violations. Well, I think if there's anything we've learned in the DFW <laughs> market based on what's gone down in the last you know five or six years, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, and it's not it's not just the DFW market. I mean, I one of the things I do at our law firm is I'm on a lot of the email chains from the government, et cetera, and trying to just keep up to date with enforcement actions and other things. And there's enforcement actions over in a kickback statute. Uh, I mean, opioids are obviously an issue and there's telemedicine and other, those DME type arrangements that are causing problems around the country. It just, it, it varies. And DFW is a hot enforcement area um, as we're aware, <laughs> given yeah. what's gone on lately. So interesting. Well, Chris, I, I so much appreciate you joining the show today. Uh, you know, this this is not um, not an easy topic to discuss because it's so complex yeah. and there's no, so I'm... many moving parts to it. Um, look, our audience is mostly healthcare professionals, and this is critical information for them to know if they want to learn more about these particular rule changes with Stark Law and anti kickback statutes. Um, where can they find more information? So we've written some short summaries on our, we have on our website, weaverjohnson.com. Um, there's also, I mean, if, if you type into Google, Stark Law Final Rule 2020, I mean, you're gonna, every law firm has written about these. There's news releases all over the place. Um, you can get full copies of the rule, although I wouldn't recommend reading those if you're not used to it, because yeah. it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're right. These, the way that these laws are written and I've said it a couple of times, it's, it's hard to talk about because you have defined term after defined term and you really just have to keep tracking and tracking. And at the end of the day, you, you might not find, find the answer go, anyway. Wee! So, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's one of those that even doing it and looking at the Stark law regulations probably daily, I still need to go back and pull them up. And it makes me through. realize 
I really shouldn't be an attorney. Yeah. I, I wasn't built for that. Yeah, I don't, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, although I, it's, I mean, it is one of those that it is interesting in the sense that, you know, you do have changes over time, you gotta adapt. It's something we do a lot, so you get comfortable advising those, but it's definitely something that may be easier to talk about if there's a specific, you know, issue. So we right. can actually show you the process as opposed to talking about it in generalities, so. Awesome, well, hey, thanks again. And uh, hey, to our audience, thanks for tuning in. Uh, certainly take the time to visit us on Facebook, um, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, hit up weaverjohnston.com uh, to get your healthcare legal feed on. They have lots of good information on that website and there are many changes coming for 2022. Uh, so any further questions, uh, We'd love to help connect you with this firm. They're great people and uh, a great depth of knowledge in all areas of healthcare. Until next week, uh, we hope you all be blessed. Take care. <laughs>